So good morning once again. I hope everyone came back because the break is over. Let's move on to the last part of our meeting. We look forward to an interesting presentation by Master of Science Claudia Uniewska. Please start. Uh, thank you very much for passing me a voice. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, the right to defense should be understood as uh, all procedural steps aimed at proving the innocence of the accused or leading to the mitigation or limitation of his criminal liability. The right to defense is a constitutional principle which is regulated in Article uh, 42, Paragraph 2 of the Polish Constitution uh, as follows. Uh, anyone against whom criminal proceedings are brought shall have the right to defense at all stages of the proceedings. Um, he may, uh, in particular, choose a defense lawyer or use a public defender uh, under the terms of the law. Uh, in turn, under the Polish Code of Criminal Procedure, the right to defend is one of the basic uh, principles of the Polish criminal process. Uh, it was expressed in Article 6 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, which indicates that um, the accused has the right to defense, including the right to use a defense lawyer, about which uh, the procedural authority is obliged to inform the accused. Uh, the right to defense has also been granted in Article 6, uh, Paragraph 3 of the uh, Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, as well as in Article 48 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, in the literature on the subject, material defense and formal defense are distinguished. Material defense is defined as any procedural steps taken by any person to protect the interests of the accused in the trial. Uh, anyone can perform it uh, for, for the accused, so it is not only the act of the accused, but also any person who performs activities that turn out to have a positive impact on accused position. position. Uh, on, on the other hand, formal defense is the use of a uh, defense lawyer by the accused. The aim of the criminal trial is to learn the material true and thus to make funct um, factual findings that are uh, the basis for all decisions. Uh, knowing about material truth is not unlimited. Uh, it is subject to certain limitations resulting from uh, the standards of the evidentiary procedure and more specifically from the evidentiary pro prohibitions. Um, the right to defense may include a number of activities that uh, the accused can perform, as well as activities that authorized by his defense lawyer. Uh, in the case of substantive uh, defense, for example, one uh, where the accused independently exercises uh, his right to defense, uh, in the case of some rights uh, that make up uh, the right to defense, there may be a legal conflict between the defendant's right to defense and the secret of classified information that is crucial from state security points. Uh, such a conflict may arise in the case of the following activities, such as submitting explanations, submitting records for an investigation, uh, final familiarization with the materials of the preparatory uh, proceedings, or requests for disclosure of files. Uh, there are examples of rights of the accused, which may be possible that uh, in Polish criminal proceedings, it is possible that the accused or his defense lawyer is refused access to the files due to the fact that they contain classified information. Uh, in this situation, we can talk about the exclusion of the principle of free access to files, the basis of which is Article 1 on 156, Paragraph 4 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Uh, expressing the directive according to which if there is a risk of disclosure of classified information, uh, such as secret or top secret, uh, feeding files, making copies and copies is carried out in compliance with the rigors specified by the president of the court. However, uh, certified copies and copies are not issued. Uh, the defense lawyer is not able to process information covered by the top secret clause and therefore uh, it is not possible to make notes or photos from the case fields. Uh, both the right to defense and the evidence prohibitions uh, rooted in the protection of classified information are crucial for the functioning of the state and the uh, citizen. 
It is worth emphasizing that neither the protection of classified information nor the right to defense should be absolute due to the fact that, depending on the um, circumstances, it should be possible to balance which of the values abounded in the right to defense or the secret or classified information should be the fact is more important in the data. Uh, if we assume the assumption that the secrecy of classic information should never be limited, then in fact that the uh, excuse could be deprived of the right to defense and ex uh, exercises of his procedural rights, uh, such as the right to request access to the files on the case pending um, against him, or he would uh, not have the possibility of submitting explanations. Uh, consequently, the rights of the defense would be a legal fiction. Uh, in the first of the cited facts, namely the explanation of the accused, there is no conflict between the right to defense and the protection uh, of classified information. In this situation, the accused has the opportunity to dispose uh, of the security uh, covered by the protection of classified information in order to exercise uh, his right to defense. Uh, while applying the principle of uh, proportionality and adequacy, uh, which should be understood as the accused should not disclose more information that is necessary from the point of view of the ongoing against him. On the other hand, uh, in the second situation, which the defender or, or the accused suffers a limitation of the right to defense, which consists in the fact that he can read the case files, uh, but cannot process them and thus take photos or, or make notes, immediately this may constitute a significant uh, inconvenience, but it cannot be said uh, that uh, this situation disproportionate measures were applied which uh, would uh, infringe the principle of the rights uh, of def defense. Um, the accused or the defense lawyers still have the opportunity to read the case files and obtain the necessary information, but what is important, they cannot uh, take them with them in enough physical form. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. The next speaker will be Master of Science Judith Torma, who will present a paper under the title current questions of minimum age of criminal responsibility in the European Union. Please welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, I can start uh, the video now and I'm trying to share my screen. Um, Uh, can you see it? Wait a second. <laughs> yes. Can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, we see only that you has uh, sharing with us, but not the presentation. Okay. Then uh, something must have happened to my uh, computer because uh, actually everything uh, froze. Just wait a second. Um. May I may I ask a couple of minutes? Maybe maybe jumping to the next. Oh no, it's coming. Maybe try again. Uh, can you see it? Unfortunately, no. No. Okay. okay then, uh, so I, I cannot present, but uh, I will speak. Okay. Uh, so the title of my uh, paper is the current questions of minimum age of uh, criminal responsibility in the European Union. 
uh, and uh, I was trying to uh, assess the, the underlying scientific uh, research and results which would uh, justify the current age limits of the minimum age of criminal responsibility in the EU. Uh, the consideration behind setting the minimum age of criminal responsibility and liability in criminal law is uh, based on a scientific assumption that uh, below a certain level of cognitive maturity, there is limited ability to apprehend the wrongness or rightness or the consequences of one, one's action. In modern legal systems, there is an institution for examining the accountability of adult offenders, where basically everyone is considered accountable after reaching a certain age, and individual differences are determined by specialized investigations if the court deems necessary. In contrast, under a certain age, uh, no one can be held criminally liable even as a result of an individual investigation. On the other hand, between the two age groups, most often between the ages of 12 and 18, the establishment of criminal liability is age-related with occasional disregard for, for individual differences. I'm gonna show you what I mean exactly. But before uh, jumping to the scientific uh, conclusions, I wanted to show you uh, the uh, position of the United Nations, uh, the Council of Europe and the European Union on the question of minimum age and criminal responsibility. Uh, for in the United Nations, uh, the development of children's rights started as early as uh, 1924, uh, when we couldn't, cannot even speak about the United Nations, uh, which didn't exist at the time. Uh, the Geneva Convention on the Rights of the Child was the first one. Then the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child came in 1959, and the first uh, set of rules for the Beijing rules came in 1985, where the United Nations set a standard minimum rule for the administration of juvenile justice. Uh, the interesting part of the Beijing rules is that it does not mention a specific age limit for uh, juvenile offenders. In 1989, uh, the no United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, uh, defines childhood under the age of 18. And compliance with the CRC, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, uh, a UN committee regularly reviews uh, member states. In their reports, the committee, committee regularly draw attention to the establishment of criminal liability, which should be, uh, in their opinion, between the age of 14 and 16. And the age of 12 is not considered internationally acceptable. Now, in Europe, uh, the Council of Europe uh, conventions uh, does not state children's rights uh, as a separate convention. It is protected under the European Charter of Social Rights and the European Charter of Human Rights. Uh, the Council of Europe states that the European Court of Human Rights provides protect protection of children, offenders, under the Article 3, the right to protection against inhuman and degrading treatment, and Article 6, the right to However, from time to time, it arises that children's rights should also be protected by a separate institution. recommendation on juvenile offenders, which applies to all offenders under the age of 18. And in 2010, the Council of Europe adopted guidelines on child-friendly justice. According to all children between the ages of uh, 0 and 17 
should participate in justice mechanisms on a child first basis. This is related to children uh, in civil or criminal proceedings as well, whether they are a part, a victim or an offender. Uh, Child-friendly justice means that all actors under the age of 18 should be treated according to their age. Now, let's see the United, uh, the European Union. In 2006, the Euro European Union adopted a strategy on the rights of the child. Then in 2012, the EU adopted the Charter of Fundamental Rights, where paragraph 24 deals entirely with children's rights. In the same year, the EU also addressed child of child, uh, rights of child victims in its definition and the rights of victims whose protection is similar to the Europe's uh, child. In 2015, a study was prepared by the European Commission's Directorate General for Legal Affairs on the provisions and practices of the member states' judicial systems in relation to children. The study showed that the age of criminal uh, record is still 14 and 15 years in the EU, and seven member states can younger children than the age of 14. The most serious achievement is that in Scotland, where the age limit was eight years, has been raised to 12 years. Serious lobbying has been launched to make it the lowest age limit in the other parts of the UK. In 2016, an EU directive encourages member states to extend justice until the age of uh, 21 for persons who were only 18 years old at the time when they were suspect. Now, what is uh, the reason for that? If we look at uh, psychological theory of moral development, then we find that the first uh, theory uh, was published in 1932 by Jean Piaget, who was a Swiss uh, psychologist. Piaget was uh, primarily uh, researching the cognitive development of the child, and he established the stage model for cognitive development, and he incorporated moral development into this cognitive development uh, paradigm. In his uh, theory, a child between uh, age of three and four does only yet have their own sets of rules and norms. The rules are embodied by the adult authority and are kept only as long as the adult is present. At the age of five to seven, the concepts of independent rules begin to emerge and then the rules and norms become hegemonic. That means that the child uh, clings to the rules in all circumstances. In this age, new rules like for example, in board games, is very hard to be introduced. Previously learned rules overwrite everything and new rule variations seem like a cheating for the child. At the age of eight and 10, the child recognizes that the real source of norms and rules is the adult, who is also the most powerful actor in the child's life. We actually call this age the age of moral realism, when the child's internal system of rules is still very conservative, but they can already accept certain injustices if it comes from the adult. This, at this age, the child tends to judge the severity uh, of an offense based on the consequences of the act and not on the perpetrator, perpetrator's intent. For example, uh, they would give a bigger punishment for accidentally breaking the vase than for uh, intentionally uh, stealing a little piece of toy. At the age of 10, between the age of 10 and 12, uh, children uh, become uh, socially more independent. Uh, their social relationships change and they become more and more directed toward their peers. 
the shift of social direction develops the principle of social reciprocity and the children begin to understand that the motivations of the others uh, influence their actions. At this age, children no longer necessarily turn to an adult to solve an injustice, but their systems of growth still have external sources. After the age of 12, moral concepts become interiorized. The rules are already followed by the child out of internal conviction. Uh, they can already judge actions based on the motives of the actor, and they realize that rules and norms are based primarily on the common agreement of people and not on the will of an authoritarian. And thus, they can sometimes even be changed. And by the age of 14, according to Piaget, internal moral concepts are consolidated and the consequences of actions become recognizable and anticipable for the child. Now, if we look at uh, the table, which uh, fortunately you cannot see that I prepared for you, actually, uh, minimum age of uh, criminal conviction in Europe is mostly 14 years old, 14 years. Only uh, there are two countries, uh, Belgium and Portugal, which sets this minimum age at age of 16. And Denmark and uh, the Czech Republic sets it at age of uh, 15. And there are still uh, countries which set the minimum age under the age of 14, which is France, where the minimum age of criminal conviction is age of 13, and the Netherlands, where it is 12 years, and Hungary, where it is 12 years as well. Now, by the leaving uh, of the United Kingdom, the lowest uh, minimum age is in Ireland, which is age of 10. Actually, in the United Kingdom, Scotland has now a minimum age of, age of 12, and uh, the rest of the United Kingdom is age of 10 still. Excuse me? Yes? Time is running out, so please conclusion. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, moral, uh, uh, modern uh, moral development theories found that uh, between the age of 14 and 18, a child's cognitive develop development is still uh, well underdeveloped uh, compared to an adult. According to modern cognitive research, morality in the ordinary sense, such as respect for existing legal order, is developed only at the age of 15 or 16. And why between the ages of uh, by between the ages of uh, 11 and 15, logical thinking and problem solving abilities develop spectacularly. The full intellectual abilities of an adolescent only develops to the extent of an adult by the age of 17 or 18. And in the case of abused or traumatized children, this development may lag behind by years significantly. Uh, Okay, and then more of the conclusion. Uh, by the age limit for uh, minimum wage of criminal responsibility of uh, 12 and 14 years were uh, scientifically, scientifically justifiable like 70 years ago, when children and I start, uh, started to blossom, they are not today. Modern scientific research and theories show that adolescent children are in especially vulnerable age period when the anticipation of their action may not biologically be acceptable. Or if it is, then their behavior does not follow logic conclusions. Thank you for your attention. We sincerely thank you for your speech. Now it's time for Mrs. Susanna Notch. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. May I ask if you can see my screen? Yes, we can see. 
Uh, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Zsuzsán Vanagy. I'm a law student at the University of Miskolc. I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about the use of telecommunications devices in uh, criminal proceedings. Hungary was not the first to introduce the use of video technology in courts, um, so it is necessary to examine its foreign antecedents. The need for video conferencing uh, first arose uh, in large countries. Uh, the simultaneous interrogation uh, via closed circuit television was introduced in the United States for the first time, more precisely in Texas in 1983. One of the most uh, striking examples is when in Florida a stage light platform was established in a prison chapel. The chapel and the court uh, were connected via an inner uh, closed circuit television, so the judge, the accused, and the other participants could uh, uh, talk to each other and they could also see each other. The defense counsel participated in the proceedings in addition to his client in the prison chapel, and the prosecutor was in the courtroom. In the United Kingdom, the Criminal Justice Act 1989 allows the use of this technique. In 1992, the first video link was established between the Norwich Prison and the Yarmouth Magistrates Court. The first British research was published in 1999 and 2000 by Joyce Plasnikov and Dr. Richard Wolfson. On this type of uh, connection between penitentiary institutions and courts, the survey showed that the negotiations were more cost effective and they could avoid the transportation of prisoners to the courts. Therefore, the security risk could be reduced. This method is also operating effectively in uh, continental proceedings. In Germany, the use of audiovisual devices has arisen in connection with witness protection. They were first used in the interrogation of uh, child witnesses by the Mind Tribunal, tribunal in May 1995. The president of the Judicial Council and the child to be interrogated were seated in a room adjacent to the courtroom and the interrogation was uh, displayed on a twice two meter screen in the courtroom. There was a telephone connection between the interrogation site and the courtroom. This was the so-called Mainz model. In France, it is also possible to use this technique during witness hearings. The video conferencing system also functioning effectively in the Baltic states, Finland, Spain, Poland, as well as in Slovenia. Let us uh, now turn to the use of telecommunication devices in Hungarian criminal proceedings. Basically, it is a judicial network in which the accused or witness is interrogated in a room separate from the place of the hearing that is equipped to transmit and record sound and images at the same time. But what justified its introduction and what does it play a significant role? The introduction of this legal institution was primarily justified by the importance of witness protection, witness welfare and victim protection. It plays a significant role in the fight against cross-border crime in witness protection and in ensuring the proceedings are conducted as quickly and as safely as possible. You could also ask, what are the benefits? The use of a telecommunication device can mean the facilitation of logistics and organizational work and the reduction of costs. It makes it possible to ensure the presence of persons who are away, possibly abroad, undergoing long-term or intensive treatment or who are otherwise difficult to reach. Using a device enabling uh, continuous video and audio recording or continuous audio communication between the place of the trial and the place of the interrogation. The recording of video and audio materials at uh, trials could, on the one hand, replace traditional minute keeping, reducing the time required for preparing decisions by a large degree, and on the other hand, it could guarantee the accurate documentation of trials at any time when necessary. The connection of court courtrooms with uh, domestic uh, partner institutions and other courts allowing for remote hearing can guarantee the safety of the person participating in this procedure and the uh, saving of time and costs involved in uh, appearing before the court, further enhancing the service provider nature of the court. In uh, September 2018, the president of the National Office of Judiciary launched a project aimed at connecting remote courtrooms uh, to international bodies, 
domestic bodies and other courts with modern state-of-the-art technical equipment. First in the country, the advanced video communications technology was built at the Eger Regional Court. As a result of uh, court dig digitalization, remote hearing has been made possible in 72 courtrooms. And since then, as the system has been expanded further, its role is even more appreciated in the current state of danger. One of the cameras is for the view of the whole room, one for the person conducting the, um, the procedural act, and a separate camera is available for presenting documents called documentum camera. We can see it on the second picture. There is a separate microphone in front of each potential litigant, in front of the judiciary, in front of the judge's platform, in front of the judge, the prosecutor, and the defense counsel. In addition, an electronic path with at least a voice connection may be used, which in practice usually means a mobile phone. There are several problems with the use of the so-called remote hearing rooms. Like any electronic device, cameras, computers, and other devices in remote hearing rooms are exposed to hazards such as power outages, technical uh, device failures, and network failures. The limited number of remote hearing uh, rooms can also be a problem. Rooms must be booked in advance for a fixed period of time, but the duration of proceedings is often unpredictable, meaning the indeterminacy of the duration of testimonies and acts of proof. So delays in time can occur. The National Office of Judiciary has set additional targets for the uh, services to be implemented. They are planning to set up a storage space for storing court recordings and the reservation system. To protect the privacy of participants who do not consent to video recording, they plan to introduce an image and sound distortion tool, as well as video editing and editing software, and uh, to allow annotation to the recorded audio and video stream. Overall, by introducing the use of telecommunications, we have taken a significant step towards a more modern uh, justice system that meets the requirements of today's modern world. In our fast-paced world, the greatest values are time and money, and with this technical solution, not only courts can work more efficient, efficiently and cost-effectively, but people involved in, uh, in procedures save money by not having to sacrifice money or time uh, to travel long distances. They can just go to the court closest to them. Proceedings have been shortened and the security risk have been reduced as it is no longer necessary to transfer detainees to court in all cases. Distances that previously seemed invincible were also bridged. The potential of telecommunication devices is significant, not only at the national level, but also in cross-border situations. Now we can operate with other countries which may be possible to hear participants or witnesses abroad. The use of telecommunications devices is also of paramount importance in witness protection, as this does not only protect the identity, but also prevent the person in need of uh, special treatment from meeting the accused. Moreover, it can also guarantee the safety of children, juveniles, and protected persons. Thank you all for listening. It was a pleasure being here today. Thank you very much. The next person to speak will be Mr. Roland Lind. So please start your speech. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen, or at least uh, trying. Okay. Uh, good. Are you able to see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm starting now. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I have to say thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity and the honor to participate in this outstanding conference by introducing my latest research in the field of criminal law. I came with a topic that is unfortunately not unknown among us, since religious manipulation is one of the most discussed questions of our days. I assume that the term terrorism came into your minds, but this time I brought another, a little bit more hidden problem the phenomenon of the cultic activity and the related problems that may emerge during criminal proceedings. The aims of the research were the following. Examine the threat behind religious fanaticism, analyze the methods of manipulation, resume the relevant regulation, and finally propose a solution. 
To achieve all this, I had to use an interdisciplinary approach using the results of various social sciences, approaching through many branches of law and using several methodologies simultaneously listed on the slide. Before the legal examination, I had to figure out an acceptable concept for all the cultic movements. I did it by using the results of sociology and religious studies. During this process, I encountered the term heresy that shows similarities. Heresy and cultists were a lot alike. Both shared the characteristic of misinterpreting the doctrines of the historical church. Additionally, cults usually have the so-called contra attitude that makes them harmful to society. This leads to our definition. A cult is such a religious movement that evangelizing the modified doctrines of a major world religion exists and works separated from the historical churches and is harmful to society. Apparently, making difference is not that simple in the practice. Some groups were evaluated differently throughout the centuries. Henceforth, to be politically correct, I intend to use the term destructive religious movement and the abbreviation DRM. In the next slides. Introducing the psychological techniques used by DRMs, in the first place, I have to mention the theory of Gustave Le Bon, who published his ideas in 1895 under the name La Psychologie des Foules. He said that the ideology spread it in three steps, statement, repetition, and mental infection. First, the idea is formulated in a simple sentence. Then the future victim hears it over and over again from his environment till he gets an emotional charge. And that's the point where the idea infects the mind. To make the infection more effective, the leaders use particular methods which are recollected by social psychologists, Preskanis and Aronson. Due to the lack of time, I would like to highlight only one of these seven, the focusing on the phantom method. It means the creation of an autopistic goal for which the followers have to sacrifice everything. That is usually a salvation-like state of mind. Of course, many more aspects of social influence could be mentioned. However, we have to concentrate on the law. Here, before starting the legal examination of cultic groups, I have to mention the process occurred in France in the 90s. Back then, cultic activity had lots of victims and French scholars knew that the regulation cannot solve the issue. French legislation decided to declare war uh, on DRMs with brand new rules. This kind of attitude was almost unique in the whole Europe. They, they saw several alternatives. Civil law could have used the establishments of limited ability to act to claim back the capital given to the manipulative movements while administrative law could have provided a new special public organization with the only purpose of supervising new religious movements. Finally, the field of penal law won and the code penal was modified the liability of the legal persons significantly increased. Uh, I analyzed the DRMs under the Hungarian penal code and here are the results. I started by observing the special part containing certain delicts. We are able to see that such organizations commit various types of crimes. Some of them are more serious, some of them are milder, but two things must be declared. These groups may not be categorized by resuming the delicts uh, realized by their members. However, all of them are far from innocent. Concerning the general part, it is recommended to observe the possible grounds for exemption. Concerning cult leaders in several cases, we can talk about mentally ill persons who are able to persuade others. If they show pathologic symptoms, these kind of false prophets may easily be considered insane and thus they shall not be punished by treated in an asylum. On the other hand, cult members are not so lucky since the manipulation cannot be the basis of insanity. In their case, coercion is not beyond imagination. Many DRMs create isolated communities where the prophet is some sort of deity-like ruler. Everyone shall obey or their families will probably be punished. We can see that this is a lose-lose situation for the future perpetrator. In this situation, imprisonment shall not be applied. And finally, I was curious if DRMs could be evaluated as criminal organizations. 
On this slide, I listed the five elements that must be fulfilled by such an organization according to Hungarian criminal law. We can constate that four objective criteria are simply fulfilled by the major part of these groups. However, the original intent is usually not illegal. Many times, religious movements exist as peaceful, isolated pseudo-societies that become aggressive for some reason. Although there are also associations that want to make profit under the camouflage of religiousness. In that case, this evaluation is possible. Now, let's take a closer look at the problems of criminal proceedings against cultic groups. It seems indispensable at this point to make difference between DRMs upon the personality of the leader. This way, we are able to identify two different categories. The first type is characterized by a mentally health leader who acts by economic means, and his final goal is to convince his followers to alienate their properties. This construction is very similar to other criminal organizations, thus I do not feel necessary to go into details. The other main category that consists of a mentally ill profit with unpredictable purposes is far more interesting. In such cases, new challenges arise during proceedings. To identify these difficulties, I would like to briefly introduce the story of Charles Manson and his small cult group. Charles Manson started to recollect followers after he was released from prison in 1967 he intended to recruit mainly young women whom he could possess both mentally and sexually. He regularly made his followers use hallucinogens and provide sexual service in exchange for money, food and accommodation. His doctrines were based on the Beatles White Album through which he foresaw the ultimate war between black and white people. He promised his followers the opportunity of surviving this event. The family became detected shortly after the famous Tate LaBianca murders, and Manson and three others of his girls faced the charges of seven counts of murders and conspiracy to murder. All defendants were sentenced to death, but due to the fact that death penalty had become prohibited in California, the judgment was modified to lifelong imprisonment. Manson died in 2017. Throughout this case, I could identify four principal issues that may make more difficult criminal proceedings. Firstly, the illegal activity of the group remained undetected for too long. The reason behind this is that the authorities did not make the proper steps to investigate the case. The earlier detection may have saved the lives of the victims since, uh, as we saw earlier, it takes many time for a follower to kill at his profit's command. Secondly, in such situations, it is almost impossible to find sufficient evidence to make an accusation. These groups usually live in an isolated place. Moreover, the loyalty of the members to each other and the leaders hardly breakable. Thirdly, the main object of such proceedings is the impeachment of the leader. Unfortunately, the members would do any briefing to clarify their shepherd. Therefore, they would probably make a false testimony before the court to clarify him. Finally, it can never be evident if the leader is in fact mentally ill and thus uh, shall not be found guilty due to insanity, or is just a great manipulator who enjoys being the ruler of others with the help of made-up ideology. Summarizing all the gained experience, I have to confess that the actual Hungarian penal code cannot handle the religious manipulation, in order, other words, brainwashing. That is why I suggest the introduction of a new state of affairs that criminalizes religious manipulation, which results in penetration or makes the victim donate all of his wealth. In addition, I would make the cessation of such groups that realize this new delect mandatory without discretion. Furthermore, to make criminal proceedings more effective, many suggestions can be formulated. On the one hand, the originally French idea of creating a new public establishment that supervises religious entities, whether they are officially registered or not, shall be considered in those countries where the cultic activity is significant. On the other hand, this organization could cooperate with the local police forces and could also initiate covered investigation. For instance, a covered agent should be suitable to find evidence against the leader. Since the followers usually do not betray their master, but try to protect him at all costs, in such cases, the clarifying and the mitigating details of the testimonies in connection with the leader 
shall be compulsorily ignored. Finally, since the followers at the end are victims themselves, they shall not be severely punished, but instead the application of the measure involuntary treatment in a mental institution may help in the reintegration process. And I think that that's all I had for today. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. The author of the last paper is Mr. Tomasz Bojanowski. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Mm, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome again. My name is uh, Tomasz uh, Bojanowski and I'm a fourth year law student uh, at the Faculty of Law and Administration of uh, Cardinal Stefan Zeszynski University in Warsaw. Uh, and I'm also an active member of Scientific Circle of Criminal uh, Law Procedure at uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University. The topic of my speech is the European Public Prosecutor Office and National Prosecutor's Office and Criminal Procedures Reflection on the Interface of the Competence. And, I, and I'm coming to the, uh, to the point because of time. <laughs> the European Public Prosecutor Office uh, IPPO is a European Union institution established by the Treaty of Lisbon between 20 community members under the Enhanced Cooperation Mechanism. Its task will be to investigate uh, crimes against the EU budget and the what fraud. The agency was launched in 2012, but it only uh, actually it took off a month ago due to coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. The European Public Prosecutor Office is headquartered in Luxembourg with uh, the office, it's had an equally of prosecutors from the all participant countries. Uh, it will manage to uh, daily criminal investigation carried out by seconded prosecutors from the participating EU countries. The IPPO will, pro uh, will prosecute uh, crimes related to fraud, corruption, money laundering, and serious uh, cross-border uh, fraud over 10 million uh, euros. Today, there are 22 EU countries uh, who have joined to IPPO. The, uh, the prosecutor office will be a two-tier uh, collective body. At the central level, the European Attorney General will have responsibility for the whole body. At the non-central level, there will be delegated European prosecutors working in the member state. Their task will be to conduct the LA investigation and to bring uh, and support prosecution in accordance with the regulation at the laws of member state concerned. At the central level, all activities of the seconded prosecutors will be monitored, guided and supervised, ensuring consistency of in investigation and prosecution across the Europe. Although the powers of the um, public prosecutor office apply only to countries participat uh, participating in enhanced cooperation, this body will also cooperate with other EU member states. The Council asked the Commission to reflect on further relevant proposals to ensure the effectiveness of this judicial cooperation. The work of the Public Prosecutor Office will uh, complement uh, the work of the OLAF and the Eurojust, which uh, do not have to resources to investigate and prosecute individual crimes. The European uh, Public Prosecutor Office was established in accordance with Article uh, 86 Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which uh, provides that in order uh, to combat uh, crimes affecting the financial interests of the Union, to cooperate in accordance with the principle of decentralization and integration into national institutions. The European Public Prosecutor Office will, uh, will not have too many responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis national authorities. The duties of national institutions are provide information on offenses, secure the necessary evidence and carry out investigative activities. Uh, Council regulation from uh, 12 October 2017 uh, implementing enhanced cooperation in the establishment of the European Public Prosecutor Office. If immediate action is required in the case even before the European Public Prosecutor Office is informed, it will be responsibility of the national uh, authorities to carry out the necessary steps for effective investigation and prosecution. If the offence does not uh, fall with the jurisdiction on the authority, the European Public Prosecutor Office will imme immediately refer the case to the competence uh, national law enforcement authorities and judicial authorities. However, in the act uh, constitutes an offense against financial interest, the national authority will again refer the case to the European Public Prosecutor Office. It will be possible to order and investigate measure at the competent law uh, enforcement authorities in the member state. 
a dual legal regime will apply to this action. Indeed, prosecutor will be obligated to carry out their activities in accordance not only with national law, but also with the condition provided by uh, for uh, in Article 26 of uh, the draft regulation of IPPO. Uh, the national authorities will be uh, not will be involved in deciding how to con uh, conclude the investigation. They will be subject of provision of the regulation and of the national law uh, of the member state when the investigation will be conducted. The most uh, questionable pa part of uh, powers of the European Public Prosecutor uh, Office uh, relates to offences of uh, inextricably linked uh, to offences against financial interest. Under Article uh, 13 of the draft, it, uh, if other offences are extremely linked to the, uh, these offences, the European Public Prosecutor Office has exclusive competence to prosecute such offences. This has been a subject of much dispute interpretation, and the same is uh, the same is true of the lack of legal definition of the place of the offence in uh, IPP regulation. There are many doubts of the procedural, uh, procedural and institutional uh, nature um, of the problem. And this may affect uh, Poland, uh, which not uh, joined to European Public Prosecutor Office. The Polish authorities have raised concern about a loss of sovereignty in this context. Our country constitutes, however, to be encouraged to participate in the activities, activities of the uh, European Public Prosecutor Office or even to sign a cooperation uh, agreement. For example, Hungary has signed a such uh, agreement. Um, the deputy of uh, Prime Minister of Poland, Jarosław Go Gowin, uh, who was former uh, Minister of Justice, say that uh, um, as the Minister of Justice, he was against Poland joining to European Public Prosecutor Office. The head of the agreement stressed that uh, the justice system should remain a sovereign domain of the EU members. He also said that uh, we are clearly in the favor of Poland's permanent presence in the European Union. We see this as the Polish raise on the edge, uh, but at the same time, we support European of homelands, not a single super state. We see this expansion of the competence of EU institutions as a threat to the integration process, rather than a strengthening of it. European Public Prosecutor Office and cooperation in criminal matters is a controversial subject within the European Union. In my opinion, the principles of the cooperation should be shaped in the direction of greater uh, equality of parties, taking into account the diversity of legal institu institutional solution operating in the public prosecutor office of member states, such as independence of prosecutors and the hierarchical subordination. In the context of functioning of the European Public Prosecutor Office, and the so-called dual subordination of seconded prosecutor to take into account the subordination as a prosecutor of member state may be problematic. We don't really know how the institution will work in the practice. It's only in the near future we will be able to assess its operation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. In order to sum up our conference, please welcome Bartomi Orenzek. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, our conference is uh, going. We can't hear uh, you. Okay, uh, and now. And now it's okay. Now, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, the ladies and gentlemen, uh, our conference uh, is uh, going um, to the end and um, I would like to, uh, on behalf of uh, Professor uh, Marcin Wielec, uh, uh, make a conclusion of the conference. Mm, uh, I'm pleased with it, uh, the conference uh, successful uh, course. Uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, we managed uh, to raise such important uh, uh, issues for criminal proceedings. Uh, the special value of today's um, conference is that it uh, presents and discusses uh, issues that are problematic and important from the point of view of the criminal process. Uh, the speakers focused on the issues of proceedings in uh, case of uh, fake news, 
and uh, deep fakes, uh, evidence proceedings uh, in cases mm, in the field of uh, cybercrime, the issue of uh, eye evidence, uh, the right, uh, the rights of uh, participants in the proceedings, and also protection of uh, classified information in criminal. Uh, in criminal uh, proceedings. Uh, the speaker uh, mentioned legal institutions such as preventing measures, temporary detention. It was especially important to discuss the problem of international legal institutions of the European Union in the context of criminal proceedings, as well as the influence of the European Union on the shape of national regulations on the criminal process and also the impact of COVID-19 on the functioning of criminal proceedings. I would like to mention uh, the scientific monograph as well, entitled uh, Contemporary Problems of Criminal Procedure, Volume 1, which will be published this year as a result of earlier editions of conferences devoted to the criminal proceedings. The issues raised by the speakers during today's event are extremely interesting and deserve a more detailed discussion in writing. As a result of today's conference, we are considering publishing the next volume of a scientific monograph devoted to contemporary problems of criminal procedure. At the end, ladies and gentlemen, or at the end of the conference, I would like to thank all the participants, speakers, guests who took part in today's event. Thank you very much.